Well, holy greetings to brothers and sisters. Good morning and God bless you. This is Scott Bradley and this is the Rivers of Life Inspirational Broadcast. We're grateful for this day, a day that the Lord has made and we are rejoicing and glad in it. Hey, let me say before I go a bit further, I've been using that scripture at the beginning of my days to prophesy my day. What do you mean by prophesying? The tense of it when David said, this is present tense, the day that the Lord has made and regardless to what comes my way today, I've set my attitude, I've set my heart in the mode of praise. I will rejoice and be glad. That's the attitude I've just taken. Look like the Lord just laid upon my heart. Just take that attitude every day when you wake up and every evening when you go to bed. The Lord has made this day and I will rejoice. I will rejoice and bless the Lord. God bless you, Brother Andre Crouch is singing that song, Praises, that we're giving to our God because the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. I'm glad that the Lord is God. Beside Him, there's nobody else. So that being said, I want to welcome you all in today to Rivers of Life, Inspirational Broadcast. We've got a word to share with you today. We feel, I feel inspired. I feel joyous. I feel the presence of the Lord. Come on in. God bless. Thank you, Brother Andre. We didn't own the rights to that music. But we do have the right to praise and magnify the God of our salvation. So we'll be hearing from Brother Andre later. Amen. But thank God for all of you that are here today. Now, listen, I want you to do, as we always ask you to do, is to hit the share button. Let other people know that we're on. Share this with your friends. Share this with your loved ones. I've, I've got a word today uh, that I'm very enthused about. Uh, again, sometimes the Lord will give me these things a week in advance, a day in advance, the morning. Well, I've actually had this in my spirit a couple of days, and so I was working on it yesterday, getting my notes together for today, and I pray that I can deliver it like I've been hearing it in my mind, even last night as I was laying down going, uh, in, in the bed last night, thinking about this today. Lord, anoint me to share this word today. Before I do that, before I do that, there's something very heavy upon my heart. Uh, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to get to know Jesus. I've noticed this now. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because I've noticed this. Uh, here lately, uh, via social media, there's been a lot of uh, presentations, a lot of uh, documentaries, a lot of statements, a lot of, uh, oh, what do you say, just, just various things that are trying to discredit the Bible, discredit the scripture, discredit Jesus. I've seen a lot of that. Now, I've also seen a lot uh, for the Bible and Jesus, of course, but look like there's a lot out there because of social media and because of the various trains of thoughts. And you know what? If you don't know Jesus, you can be persuaded by some of these things. Again, some folk are trying to be logical. They're trying to quote history. And in many cases, I think they're not quoting it correctly. Uh, but if you don't know history, how do you know? You know? Uh, it's very easy for me to get up here and quote something that you know nothing about from an ancient time that you're not familiar with and say, this is where that came from. So I'm noticing people are trying to say that the Ten Commandments were first used in another group. And, and uh, this idea, I remember back when I was in college, uh, my college professor uh, tried to convince us that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost came from the ancient Egyptian teaching of Father, Mother, and Son. That was the Trinity and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, I'm, I'm just, when we know what we know, when you know the Lord and you have spent time with Jesus, you know that his word is right. The Lord does not need assistance from the Quran, from the teachings of Buddha, from the teachings of Confucius. The Lord does not need us to indulge in those things. Know his word because the Bible says you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the sun set free is free indeed. God bless all right. Uh, I want to visit this today. Uh, this is a familiar uh, biblical story to those of us that are familiar with the scriptures. And it's been on my heart, as I stated, uh, pretty heavy the past few days. And I want to share with you today. In fact, you know, sometime I think maybe I've even shared this before. I mean, well, of course, we've been on now close to, I think, five years. and can't help but repeat some things, if, if not uh, the, the titles itself. Uh, sometimes the phrases within, well, you know, I've been preaching 48 years, so I'm sure I've said something before that I've said repeated it over time. Uh, but I pray that as it comes forth today, whether you've heard it or not from me, that it comes in a fresh spirit, in a fresh light, that you might be blessed and even healed from your situation. St. John, the eighth chapter, 
And uh, let me start in verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Uh, I want to comment on that, but I'm going to come back to it. Now, Moses of the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, then they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger wrote on the ground and thought he heard them not, as though he heard them not. And when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, cast the first stone at her. And he again stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus lifted himself up and saw, uh, uh, let me make sure, and, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And he, Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Uh, that story, when I read it, there are a number of, what can I say, hypocrisies, inconsistencies, the mindset of a lynch mob. And this is why I use the title for this, the lynch mob, uh, in this story. First of all, it was the religious leaders that brought this woman to Jesus. You know, and I've said this before. Sometimes you get more trouble out of religious folk than out of common people. Uh, of course, you know, remember what people say that all the time. And uh, are you saying that we should not make uh, to call out sin? I'm not talking about calling out sin. I'm talking about people that have a religious, that have a motive behind their intent to do harm, a motive to justify their intent to bring bodily harm, physical harm, and even death upon people. And they feel justified because they have religious ideology to do it. God told us to do this. God commanded us to do this. We have a right to do this because God told us, you know, again, yeah, notice this, the religious leaders, Here's the hypocrisy of this. It takes two to commit adultery. Now, where is the man in this? Uh, the scripture said that both should be stoned. And I remember reading that too long ago, I believe it was in the book of Numbers. Both should be stoned. But here they only bring a woman. Now, where was the man? Well, looking at this, and again, I, I'm making an assumption here. You know, again, I, I, I have no proof except what I'm calculating in my own mind that possibly the one that they that was committing adultery with her was one of their friends, one of other religious leaders. You know, it reminds me of a story. Actually, I had two stories that I heard years ago. One fellow I knew particularly, uh, personally, who, who told me this story. Uh, but I knew of the story of a man uh, who uh, had committed adultery with this woman. And according to what the woman had told, and after he had finished committing adultery with her, then he began to pray for her and rebuke her because she deceived him into committing adultery. Instead of taking responsibility for what he did, he shifted the blame to her. Well, that's easy to do. So in other words, he, he, he absolved himself, even though he committed the act of adultery with her, blamed her and said, well, she deceived me. You know, you've know, oftentimes heard me say this, brothers and sisters, explanations is not repentance. Explaining to God why you messed up, why you did wrong, why you've done the wrong thing, that is not repentance. Another story that I had a fellow tell me personally, uh, he said, man, I knew this, this woman in church liked me. Uh, now he was married, she was married. I knew that she liked me. She was flirtatious with me in church. He said, one day I decided to go over her house to get this thing straight. <laughs> big mistake, big mistake. He went over there to try to quote get her straight, he knew good and well there was an ulterior motive. He knew good and well he was walking in a situation with his eyes wide open. And yet he went over there and, of course, got into adulterous affair, got into a situation. Uh, he later told me because of other circumstances that he, he, he had to wind up leaping from the second-story window to get out of there when someone had found him out. Well, you know, 
These are situations that you walk into with your eyes wide shut. First of all, uh, Paul said to Timothy, flee fornication or adultery. Flee. Don't even run around it. You, sometimes I think we, uh, I'm going to put this, underestimate ourselves or maybe overconfidence in ourselves to feel like these things won't affect us. Stay away from those situations. When Potiphar's wife uh, went after Joseph and grabbed his coat to try to get him to have an adulterous affair with her, the Bible said he ran. He ran, left his coat and ran. Well, what is the point? The point is that we, we sometimes can be hypocritical because we try to use certain things to justify the wrong thing. Notice the hypocrisy of this situation. Where was the man? I'm sure he's probably saying, well, you know, friends of mine, she, 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 seduced, she seduced me. She deceived me. She did that. And they gave him a pass. But they are determined to get rid of this young lady, possibly because they had been in an affair with her too. I'm just speculating. And because this woman had slept with all these religious leaders, we got to find a way to get rid of her. Not because necessarily they, they didn't like the pleasure she was giving her, but because sooner or later she might have told and all of them would have been found out. So we got to cover this thing up. We got to get rid of this girl. So let's take the scripture and use it to justify getting rid of her. You know what they do? They come to Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm painting a, a, a picture here. Praise the Lord. I'm painting a picture uh, that you all might see and compare things that happen today with what happened in this very story. They come to Jesus. And I think this is interesting because they come to Jesus quoting the law to the law, not realizing it. Who's the lawgiver? God. Who's the lawgiver? God. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus is the lawgiver. And so they come to the lawgiver quoting the law. You know, it reminds me, a number of years ago, I was in uh, traffic court. I had to stand before the judge over a, a traffic violation. Uh, and, and I was talking to a lawyer about it. And that had to do with one of these, these lights, these uh, 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 cameras. Uh, and, and, I, and I quoted to him, I said, sir, I said, I think this is a violation of the 14th Amendment. Well, the, the judge was the law. He was the, as far as I was concerned, I'm standing before the law, the judge. Uh, and, and the judge responded to me, not very well, mind you. He said, that's a matter of interpretation. I, I could have went on with that and said, well, by whose interpretation? But I figured I'd leave it at that. But, but again, to quote the law to the law is not necessary because the lawgiver knows what the law means. They go to the law. Jesus, who gave the law to Moses and said, now Moses said we should stone such a one. You know, Jesus didn't go through what I just went through and say, yeah, well, where's the man in this? Or, or uh, you know, how many of y'all have been with this woman? He didn't go through that. He simply ignored them. Got on the ground and started writing in the ground. Now, once again, I don't know what he was writing. The Bible doesn't say what he was writing. But I would not be surprised if Jesus started writing the names of some of these other hypocrites in the sand. Again, I can't say that's what it was. I'm not going to tell you that's what it was. I'm just saying I wouldn't be surprised if it was what it was. Whatever he was writing, he just ignored them. They kept on pressing him. What are we supposed to do? You know, the reason why they did this, first of all, their motive was, was evil every time you look around. I'm talking about religious leaders. I'm talking about people that are supposed to lead the people, which is what, unfortunately, we have a lot of in this 21st century and throughout time, people that are in religious positions. And the Bible describes them, describes them as having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The Bible describes them as false teachers and false prophets and even false Christ. The Bible has nothing good to say about them. The Bible calls them workers of iniquity because many in the day of judgment will say, Lord, we've cast out devils in thy name. We preached in thy name. We, we did this. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now, that's a sad thing, brothers and sisters, to hear that on the last day. All these religious leaders, just because they're religious, doesn't mean they're right. And you can see, as time progresses, the ulterior motive behind what they're going to do. Things that happen now, many of the wars that are happening, are happening in the name of religion. Uh, racism that has happened in America has happened in the name of religion. 
some of your racist groups uh, that 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 uh, feel superior, taking scriptures out of the Bible, quoting them out of context to justify their evil actions. And we see the same thing happening here. They're quoting the law to the law to justify what they want to do for various reasons, for various reasons. Amen. But going back to this, Jesus ignores them. Jesus ignores them. Uh, and when he finally stands up and, and says, he that is without sin among you cast the first stone. You know, it's interesting to look at the wisdom of Jesus and the way Jesus handled the confrontation from the religious leaders. Because religious leaders were always trying to trap him. Uh, the religious leaders were always trying to, uh, you know, make him look bad, discredit him, you know. And, and a lot of times Jesus didn't have a lot of words for them. He simply used a simple word of wisdom and, and stumped all of them. He that is without sin among you, cast the first stone. You know what, what I find interesting about this? Listen to what I'm saying. The only person who had that authority, who was without sin, who could have cast the first stone was Jesus. Jesus was without sin. Nobody else, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the, the scribes, all those people that brought this woman, the, all the people, that, he that is without sin among you, all you religious hypocrites, all you religious leaders, all you religious folk, he that is without sin among you, cast the first stone. Jesus was the only one that could have threw that first stone. But you know what? He didn't. You know what the Bible says? Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. You know, brothers, this is one of the things I, I, I oftentimes say, and you've probably heard me say this on these broadcasts before, is that I depend on the mercy of God. I am a recipient of the mercy of God. And because I'm a recipient, because I depend upon it, the Bible said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, there was a story in the Bible, parable that Jesus told, about the servant who owed his master, and I think the equivalent would have been like $10,000 in today's conversion. He owed his master a lot of money. The master was getting ready to have him taken to jail. But the servant fell down and pleaded and said, Master, be patient with me. Be merciful to me, and I will pay you all. And the Bible said the master was moved with compassion. He felt sorry for the man. Because he pleaded so earnestly and pleaded so humbly to have mercy on me. Now, again, you talk about a lot of money, even back in those days. And the Bible said he forgave them all. He forgave them the debt. He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But then that same master, or that same servant, that was the recipient of the mercy of his master, found one of his fellow servants, not one that was beneath him in, in rank or authority, but a fellow servant who owed him 10 pence, equivalent to $10. And said, pay me on it. He said the same thing. I'll just be patient with me. I'll get it for you. But he wouldn't. The Bible said he had him cast in prison. And that the torment has come to, to get $10 out of the man. When the master saw what had happened, he regretted that he was merciful to this man. And then took him back into court and said, now you pay me every penny. And took that man and had him put in jail. And the Bible said the torment has came to him. All of that. Why? Because the man who was forgiven much couldn't forgive a person that owed him less than his overall debt. You know, how many times has the Lord been merciful to us and yet we want to see other folk get what they get, get what they deserve, get what they deserve, get your come up. You, you, you violated me. I'm going to see. Blessed are the merciful. St. Matthew 5, 14 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. All right, so again, notice what he said. Jesus said, he that is without sin among you, cast the first stone. None of them could have did that except Jesus. And yet the thing I love about this, Jesus didn't cast a stone. Notice the furtherance of the story. The Bible said every one of them left one by one and began to see themselves and realize, man, it's ridiculous. Why are we going to stone this woman to death? Then they begin, and I can imagine they begin to see the hypocrisy of this whole thing. You know, sometimes, brothers and sisters, we need to think. And I have to find a lot of time, folk, when, when they really start to think, 
They really started to realize how ridiculous this is. Unfortunately, many of them uh, don't have a mindset to think within logic. People who have a, a uh, racist agenda or prejudiced agenda where they just want to see somebody killed or just see somebody dead, after a while, the hatred begins to take over their common sense. The hatred begins to take over their logic. And all they can see is the way to get rid of this person, to kill this person, to, to, to you know, and again, once again, I said before, sometimes even afraid because of what they know. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I've never been involved in the mafia, but I've seen the movies. I've seen the movies. And uh, sometimes it's, it becomes uh, quite interesting uh, that they want to wipe a guy out because of what he knows. He knows too much. We got to kill him. We, he knows too much. He can expose this whole operation. He can blow the whole thing. We got to get rid of him. And sometimes uh, when that mindset is in place, people won't look at it from a logical standpoint. They begin to look at it from the threat that it could be or the threat that a person can be. They can expose us. They can expose us. Well, one of the reasons why now that we have such racial prejudice here in this country of America, and I want to pray, I ask everyone in the, the view that view this other parts of the world, pray for America. America has backslidden. America has turned away from God. And you see the, the reflection of it, even in the economy, even in the world status. America is no longer number one when it comes to the world financial status. You know, we're, we're losing our place because this nation has made money their God and that God can not help them in this crisis. We've turned away. We've become immoral. We're justifying sin. We're justifying the wrong thing. We're justifying abominable things and throwing it in the face of God. And as a result, the Bible says righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Oh, the word of God is right. And we need to pray for mercy. We need to pray for one another. We need to pray for the help of the Lord. But going back to this, notice the attitude of Jesus now. When he looks up after he'd been riding on the ground, nobody's left but the woman. Now, once again, Jesus could have threw the first stone. Mind you, he didn't say everybody had to be without sin. He said, he that is without sin among you, throw the first stone. Once you do that, it's free for all. Everybody throw a stone, regardless of what your status is. None of them could throw the first stone except Jesus. But what did Jesus do? Hallelujah. This is the loving part of our God. This is the merciful part of our God. This is why I consider myself greatly blessed by the mercy of God. Jesus said, where are your accusers? No man can condemn me, Lord. He said, neither do I. Now, now think about this. I want y'all to get this. I pray that you get this. He could have thrown that stone. And, and, and again, according to his own law. And yet, the Lord had mercy. Brothers and sisters, this is why I say to you, and I say to you again, I depend, and you ought to say, you depend on the mercy of God. The mercy of God. What is mercy? Mercy is extended pardon even though we don't deserve it. Mercy is getting a second chance or another chance, because most of us blew the second chance. A long time ago, some of y'all say God is God of a second chance. Oh, I blew the second chance a long time ago. Hallelujah. If all I had was two chances, I'd still be in bad trouble. Praise the Lord. But thank God he's God of another chance. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. When I think about it, bless the Lord. He's God of another chance. And if we repent of our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Blessed be the name of our God. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the God that has mercy upon us. Hallelujah. I can't help but bless him. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Are y'all getting this? I pray that you are. Amen. As I said before, Jesus was the only one uh, that could have cast the first stone at her, but instead he was merciful. He says to her, I'm not going to condemn you even though you violated the law. I'm not going to condemn you even though you've transgressed my law. I'll condemn you. I'm not going to throw a stone at you. Oh, and I can imagine because Jesus saw the hypocrisy of the rest of them. You know, sometimes uh, brothers and sisters, and, and this happens in the church, this happens in religious circles. Uh, we can be brought before uh, put on the carpet, as I should say, by people that just plain don't like you. This is the way it is. Even in, not just in the, in the, in the world, but in the church. People don't like you. Uh, they, don't, they don't like your testimony. 
even though they're in the church, they don't like the fact that they feel like you're more blessed than they are, you know, whatever that means. Uh, they don't like the fact that you are moving up. You know, I've had people, uh, and when I was coming up again as a, as a young preacher, uh, young uh, peers in, in ministry that were jealous of me. And, I, and to be very honest with you, there are some folks that I envied as well. Like, they're very straight now, you know, I, and probably for the wrong, well, sure, for the wrong reasons. I got a little old and mature. I realized I didn't have to be feel threatened by that preacher, you know, that young man. You know, again, to be very honest with you, uh, and it's a human emotion when you see someone who uh, you feel is, is, is better than you, what they do well. And, and I was never envious to the point where I would badmouth them, you know, I mean, at least not my recollection. Uh, but, you know, sometimes that's an emotion that people go through because we have a, a, a tendency, which is a mistake, to look at others and compare ourselves to others and sometimes not appreciating the gift that God has given to us. Now, as an older man, as an older man, I look back even in my ministry and see that there were things that the Lord uniquely blessed me to do that everybody was not able to do. And, and again, one of them being the uh, Chicago Bulls team chaplain in the NBA for 37 years, ministering. Uh, there were those that had a problem with that. There were those that said, if I was really a man of God, I wouldn't be going down there in, in that environment. Well, you know, they wouldn't understand because God didn't give it to them. God gave it to yours truly, you know. So sometimes people don't understand because really they just don't know how the Lord is using you and what the Lord is using you in. And that, that, that happens. Uh, but going back to the original point, Jesus saw the hypocrisy in all these other religious, uh, these religious leaders and why they wanted to kill this woman in the first place. Because they realized that their motive was not godly. Their motive was not right. And so because they had an ungodly motive, uh, Jesus was not going to honor what they wanted to do anyway. What? Kill a woman. Because she was in an adulterous affair. Uh, and notice the comparison how the Lord is even with Israel. When you see the nature of God, Israel continued to go whoring, what the Bible called it, after other gods. They continued to forsake God after God did so much. And even when you read the prophet Hosea, when God used Hosea as an example uh, to uh, marry a prostitute, he knew that this woman wasn't right. He knew that this woman had a reputation. He knew that this woman uh, was a woman uh, 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 that had given her body to other men. And yet God commanded Hosea to marry her and she would leave him, go back into Hori. And God commanded him to go back and get her. You know, eventually Hosea began to develop a heart for the woman. And when she would leave him, he would go back and get her, not because God told her to, but because he actually developed a heart and a love for this woman. And the Lord said that's the way he was toward Israel. He continued to love them. He continued to say, come back. Let us reason. You're going after other gods. You're, you're, you're committing spiritual adultery. You're whoring what the Bible said. After other gods, none of them have done for you what I've done because they're all false. You keep falling back into the same thing. And yet, I still love you. You know, that's the real love in marriage. And, and I see my time is about up here. I'm going to bring this to a uh, close here very shortly. But you know, brothers and sisters, that's when a man and a woman really love each other. They're willing to forgive the faults. Um, you know, marriage now in America particularly is not what the Bible designed it to be. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I've discovered that many people do not marry as the vows say, till death do us part. They marry and stay married as long as things are going good. But as long as they run into trouble, well, there's a quick fix. We don't even have to have a reason to divorce. Just well, gee, uh, differences. <laughs> I can't think of it all, man. You know, just in other words, no fault divorce we threw. You know, used to be a time you had to have adultery. Uh, you had to have uh, uh, abuse, you know, all kind of stuff. Not now. And people don't get married for the long haul. People don't get married for life. They get married until, you know, we can't do this no more, let's divorce, and then they go on to something else. That's not God's divine design. That is not God's divine intent. But God love toward Israel. God's love toward us. That while we were yet sinners, he died 
for the ungodly. One of these broadcasts, I see my time is about up now. One of these broadcasts, I want to deal with what the crucifix actually entailed and what took place uh, during the crucifixion. Uh, because the pain, the suffering, the agony that Jesus went through just for me and just for you, it will bring tears to your eyes to know what the Lord did that we might be saved. And that's why, as a minister of the gospel, I much preach to you and tell you that Jesus is the only way. It's not in Buddha. It's not in Mohammed. It's not in Confucius. It's not in religion. It's not in Mary. It's not in the, 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 the saints. It's not in the Old Testament people. It's in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Blessed are the merciful. I want you to get that. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Our time is up. I pray that you got this today. I pray that you got it. Oh, my God, I pray that you got it. If you got to look at this again, get the message that's being sent today. Until next week, this is Scott Bradley saying, God bless you. I love you. Pray for me. We'll be talking again real soon. God bless.